Hello, and welcome to the LMG December webinar, How Hackers Steal Payment Cards and Ways to Reduce Your Risk. My name is Natalie, and I'm your moderator for today. Before we start the program, I would like to give you some housekeeping information. First, we would like to encourage attendees to use the computer audio feature of this webinar. During the program, should you experience any audio interference, such as static or intermittent audio due to a busy network, please use the optional phone connection, which is listed in the audio tab of the webinar interface. Second, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the program. You can submit questions anytime by using the QA tab in the webinar interface, or you can save them until the end. Next, the video of the webinar and handouts will be available after the event. All attendees will receive a notification once the video is live which also include links to the supplemental files. Please feel free to download these helpful files for your reference later on. And last, but certainly not least, a survey will be available to you at the conclusion of this webinar. We would appreciate it if you took the opportunity to provide feedback on your webinar experience. Our presenter for the webinar today is the founder of LMG Security, Sherry Davidoff. Sherry Davidoff is the CEO of LMG Security. As a recognized expert in cybersecurity and data breach response, Sherry has been called a, quote, cybersecurity badass by the New York Times. Her new book, Data Breaches, Crisis and Opportunity, is available now. Her professional experiences are featured in the book, Breaking and Entering, the extraordinary story of a hacker called Alien. Sherry is a GIAC certified forensic examiner and penetration tester, receiving her degree in computer science and electrical engineering from MIT. Sherry, at this time, I am passing you control of the webinar. Thank you so much, Natalie. I really appreciate it. So last year, every year we do a talk on payment card security around this time because of course a lot of people are shopping either in person or online and either merchants are getting hacked or your credit card number is getting stolen in other ways. This year is different. Um, because of COVID-19, we are seeing a dramatic increase in the number of, in the amount of online shopping. And you can see this in Adobe's uh, analytics right here. This is a chart that shows the project projected online holiday spend by year. And this year, the, uh, the number, the amount of holiday spending is anticipated to be up 33% by over $47 billion. So hackers go where the money is, right? They go where the headlines are, they go where the money is. And so we're anticipating that hackers will be targeting e-commerce sites and online spending even more than before this year. So let's take a look at exactly how your credit card number gets stolen. Also, we're seeing an increase uh, pretty much steadily year over year in smartphone shopping. So shopping using apps on your phone. And again, as uh, hackers are watching those trends, either unconsciously or consciously, we anticipate that they too will be targeting those apps or, or sending you phishing emails that relate. This is um, the projected spending just within the past couple of weeks uh, during the holiday season. So you can see how it compares to 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019. On Cyber Monday back in 2016, we were just a little over $5 billion. And this year, the anticipated spend was over $12 billion, more than double. So expect to see that amount that attackers are investing in e-commerce attacks increasing proportionally. Today we're going to talk about, first of all, the changes uh, that COVID-19 has brought to the online shopping landscape. And actually, it's not just online shopping. We've also seen some changes to in-person shopping as well, which actually have improved security in a lot of ways. Um, we are going to talk about the two different vectors of attack. So criminals are targeting consumers and they're targeting merchants. And we'll discuss the different ways that they do it. Everything from phishing to password theft to malware that goes on your system and and, uh, catches um, credit card numbers and debit card numbers as you type them in to attacks on the merchants. So physical skimming on point of sale systems, network-based attacks, and then the e-commerce and e-skimming. And along the way, we'll give you tips for defending yourself. One of the things I like most about this topic is that 
all of us are consumers. Everybody in, in our country is using debit or credit card numbers these days. And so as we go through this presentation, feel free to shout out questions in the Q&A panel if you have questions from a consumer perspective, in addition to those of you who are actually um, managing, credit, managing credit card payments and have questions about e-commerce or physically taking payments. So we'll be addressing both of those. So how do criminals get your credit card number? A number of different ways, which we've put on the screen here. Number one, we see phishing and password theft. So let's dig into that and see how it's changed over the course of the last six months or so. Here's one example of a recent uh, phishing email, actually just from yesterday, December 8th, 2020. You can see that this is from Walmart. Walmart pending delivery. We attempted to deliver your item at 1.30 p.m. And this is the type of email that consumers, for the most part, only started to get this year. You know, um, store deliveries have ramped up dramatically. A lot of people are sitting in their homes and ordering things through same-day delivery that have never done that before. Maybe last year would have just run out to the store. So all of a sudden, we're seeing an increase in the number of emails that people are getting, and therefore the number of links that they're clicked on, that they're clicking on. So this this is fake. Um, it says log in to track your order at walmart.com. And what's going to happen? Well, probably there's a phishing website that looks like Walmart and the, the consumer is going to type in their username and password, which is going to get stolen. The criminals will use that to, will use that to log into the real walmart.com and maybe use saved credit card numbers to make purchases. Um, or, or engage in other types of fraud. They may also use those passwords and try them in other e-commerce sites, as we'll get to in a few minutes. Here's another example of a very current phishing attack. This is a website that mimics Pandora. It is not actually Pandora, but we're seeing these sales um, just over the past couple of weeks, 90% off everything. This is not real. And in this case, there's a really good tell because the name of the store is misspelled on this email, Pandroa. Um, that is not quite right. But again, lots of early bird sales, early bird specials. Uh, the shopping season has been stretched out this year. We're seeing a lot more sales happening in November and over the course of a longer period of time. And that's just giving criminal, criminals a longer window of time to engage in these attacks effectively. Here you can see how those weekly special offers increased as the holiday shopping season intensified. So back in September, um, this is according to, uh, to Threat Cloud. Uh, back in September, there were about 99 phishing campaigns about special offers that they that they captured. By the time we hit early November, it was up to 243, 235. So it had more than doubled in that time frame. And we do anticipate um, that by the time the numbers come out for this month, they will have gone up uh, again. Another common scam we're seeing this year, again, to watch out for our shipping scam. So this is how people are getting their stuff this year. Um, you can see a lot of people are getting their, their um, goods through standard shipping or expedited shipping. So people are expecting to have emails confirming that. And then buy online, pay in store or pick up in store is also another option. And again, criminals go where the money is and they're following. So in October, we saw um, about, this is by Checkpoint. In October, there was a, a decent amount of spear phishing attacks relating to shipping. By November, that had gone up dramatically. And you can see the breakdown there were the majority of the phishing attacks that checkpoint traced were dhl related shipping attacks and these are worldwide um 37 were amazon related and then seven percent were fedex so that's the brand that was on the phishing scams and you can see why it works hey your parcel arrived at the post office view attachment for your shipping doc or maybe we tried to deliver your package and couldn't whatever it is people are expecting packages right now a lot of people and if they blast these out they're going to get clicks they're going to get a response in this case i wanted to show you this example because it takes you to a very realistic looking website for the shipper again in this case dhl and what the criminals are going to do is they're going to try to capture that password and either use that to log into your account or just take it and use it in, in credential stuffing attacks to log in other places. What are credential stuffing attacks? Uh, we've been talking about this quite a bit. And just as a little refresher, credential stuffing attacks are where criminals steal your username, steal your password, maybe from other hacked websites or from phishing attacks. And they're just going to use that in uh, part of a bulk database to try to break into other websites, often other e-commerce sites. So if they find your passwords from the LinkedIn data breach or from the Macy's data breach or whatever it is, they might try to log into PayPal, to your online banking, to your Amazon, to lots and lots lots of other places. 
Um, oh, this is one of my favorite quotes of all time from Microsoft. Hackers don't break in, they log in. It is happening. And as of this summer, there are 15 billion, at least 15 billion compromised credentials for sale on hacker forums. You can see collection number one right here. This was a collection of over 700 million stolen usernames and passwords. So they are out there. Here's an example from this summer where Instacart customers' personal data was being sold online. And you might think, oh my goodness, Instacart has been hacked. Well, Instacart came back and said, we were not hacked. So, so there are a few clues of this. First of all, it was hundreds of thousands of Instacart customers. They were fresh. They were, um, you can see from the subheader here that they were, there was information on transactions as recent as yesterday. So that's not indicative of a breach that happened a month or two months ago or a year ago or anything along those lines. Also, Instacart has millions of customers. So you might want to think like, why is only a subset of these being offered? Instead, what Instacart suggested was that customers were being attacked uh, using phishing attacks and their password were being stolen either from their own computers or from other places and then they were being targeted with credential stuffing attacks so criminals were just stealing those passwords and then logging into instacart and if that password was legitimate it was then being sold on the dark web so unfortunately um, there are lots of ways that criminals have to steal your password and those are then used in other e-commerce sites all right, so that's modern phishing and password theft. Let's take a look at malware, malicious software, and how criminals are using that to get a, to get a hold of your password and your credit card numbers. What you're looking at here is information stealing malware. Take a look at that screenshot of the Zeus botnet. Back in the day, I'm old, <laughs> back around 2008, 2009, the Zeus botnet was like the latest development. It was commercial hacking software. Criminals would send you phishing emails, infect your computer. And once your computer was infected, they could see everything you typed into a web browser. This was a huge deal at the time because they could see the credit and debit card numbers that you typed in. They could see your username and password as you typed it in. And all that information just went right back to the attacker. Nowadays, um, these, we called them at the time banking Trojans, they have evolved to have some much more advanced capabilities. So they can actually steal the files on your computer, they can control your computer, they can install more malware. And that's where we start to see tools like Emotet and TrickBot. You've probably heard those names thrown about a number of times. Emotet will steal your usernames and passwords and credit card numbers and also distribute ransomware or distribute TrickBot. They have affiliate relationships with each other. So again, this is all wrapped up in the concept of commercial hacking software originally designed to steal your bank account number, your credit card numbers, and it is very, very good at that. So let's take a look at how Emotet works. Um, this is something that you all should be really familiar with. So you'll see a phishing email. This is one from this summer. The Emotet group was very quiet for a while. And then around July, we started to see a huge resurgence of Emotet phishing emails. So on the left, you see one, please open the attached document. That's it. And expect to see some around the holiday season that again, relate to shipping or relate to in-store pickup or things like that, things of that nature. So please open the attached document. When you open it, you will see a document with often an error message that says click enable editing and then enable content. And as we talked about in the ransomware alert webinar that last month, the reason they're doing this is because there is a macro, a malicious script embedded in this document, but it won't run unless you give it permission to do so. So the good news is we have control over that. We as the defenders, um, if you do click enable editing and enable content, the malicious script will run on your computer and you will get infected. And unfortunately, a lot of people do that. So don't click on that button. That's just an example of how Emotet works. And often these tools like Emotet will automatically steal your passwords that are saved in your web browser. Uh, this is super common. If you get an infection, just assume at this point that all the passwords in your web browser have been taken. What you're looking at here is a screenshot um, from our laboratory where a, where a computer was infected with Emotet. And again, that password went right out the door. And what do criminals do with that password? These are some fresh screenshots from the dark web. So here you can see a verified PayPal account with a balance. So the criminals have stolen your PayPal username and password. They will verify it and often have an understanding of what that balance is because of course, the higher the balance, the more they can sell it for. So again, right here, just from last week is a screenshot from the dark web where you're getting verified PayPal accounts and whole e-commerce thing. Here's another one, Chase bank account with user agent and cookies. So um, you don't have to worry about trust this device or things like that. You can just log right in. There's 
a lot of items available. What is that? Like 999,999 price is 40 bucks for a Chase bank account with user agent and cookies. Okay, this is one of my favorite new screenshots. Again, this is from our laboratory and it might look like a lot, lot of gobbledygook, but again, this is from a newly infected computer. Within 10 minutes of the user clicking on that link, the criminals had stolen things like their credit card number right there. We had just put fake information in it, but boom, there's the saved credit card number. So if you autofill credit card information, they just suck that right out of your computer. And then the criminals also grabbed all the saved billing information that automatically gets filled out. You can see it right there. Um, Sue lives at 1337 Hacksaw Lane in Sherman Hills, Illinois, 90210. Um, once they have your credit card number, they will either use it or sell it. And a lot of times the groups that are stealing your credit card number are different than the groups who are actually gonna monetize it and take that risk of cashing out. So here you can see credit card numbers for sale on the pirate market. This is, whoops, this is one of my favorite screenshots because it shows that you can get free shipping, yay, on the credit card numbers that you've just purchased. You can get a pack of 10 credit card numbers for 70 bucks on the pirate market. Here's another one from last week. Um, you can see they have credit card numbers coming from all over the world. These are credit cards from the UK. There is um, full, so full information about people as well as name, address, credit card number, you name it. And they're ranging in price uh, often about 20 bucks each, but it'll depend on the balance and how recently it's been stolen. And then in this holiday season, gift cards are another uh, type of commodity on the dark web. So this is actually a gift card checker. That means, let's say a criminal has infected your computer, you've typed in a gift card um, number, they will take that gift card number and they have special software to check it. The software costs $1, it'll check it, it'll find out what the balance is for Amazon in this case. And then if there is a balance on it, they'll go ahead and use that gift card. So first they're gonna go ahead and check it. And I love this, why buy from us? We deliver full support on all our products. You will get 100% satisfaction guarantee for your $1. So what can we do to protect ourselves as consumers? Um, and what, how can we help our employees protect themselves, also your finance department? Um, of course, use strong passwords. I know we reiterate this a lot, um, but I just wanna emphasize this year, we've really seen a big change in how criminals are leveraging passwords and a strong password equals a unique password. So it's not enough to have a password that has numbers and letters and squirrel noises. In fact, it doesn't really matter how complicated your password is if the criminal just steals it off of your computer, right? It could be 25 characters long and super complicated, doesn't really matter. So unique passwords are really important. And that way, if one website you're using gets hacked, the criminals can't use that in every other website. Or if one password gets captured um, from a phishing attack, the criminals can't go ahead and use that for everything. I would also highly recommend using a password manager. I think a password manager is the most underutilized security tool out there today. Run, don't walk to get yourself a password manager and to deploy it to everybody. I see lots of organizations that have a policy of pick really good passwords, everybody, um, but it's very hard to check and make sure people aren't reusing things. Often they are. And then you have to be realistic. If you don't give people a secure place to store it, they'll store it in their web browsers, they'll store it in Word documents, or they'll just pick passwords that they can remember that aren't very good because the human brain is not designed to remember passwords. So we all need to be realistic and to use password managers. They can help you generate secure passwords. Again, one of those very underutilized features, and they can also help you securely store them. If you're going to use a cloud-based password manager like LastPass, I highly recommend that you use two-factor authentication to protect your um, all your eggs as they're in that, that one basket. Speaking of two-factor authentication, that's our last big recommendation for consumers. Um, make sure you're using it. So in security, we say that there are three ways to verify someone's identity, to authenticate people, something you know, something you are, and something you have. Something you know is like a password. Something you are, something you have is uh, like your phone, for example. You can see an example of an app that's saying, hey, are, are you trying to actually log in? And you have to actually have the phone in front of you in order to pass um, that authentication check. And finally, something you are could be a fingerprint, iris scanning, biometrics of some kind. When we talk about using multi-factor authentication, we mean using more than one method of verifying your identity. And many of the major e-commerce sites support this. So in Amazon, I've actually given you a screenshot there. It's very easy to set up two-step 
verification, that's what they call it. Um, so you can create uh, an, a section for Amazon in your Authenticator app, and then when you log in, you have to enter the one-time password. So these different e-commerce sites may work differently. I really like the ones that pop up and say, hey, are you actually trying to log in? Um, but if you have to enter a code, that's certainly better than risking uh, having a criminal actually get access to your e-commerce site. All right. Moving along, let's talk about some of the other ways that criminals are stealing our credit and debit card numbers. And in order to really understand how our companies, our organizations are getting hacked, let's go back in time for a minute and talk about one of my favorite people, the greatest payment card thief in history, Albert Gonzalez. Albert Gonzalez, such a nice guy. Um, he, uh, Albert Gonzalez was um, a professional carter. He was actually also working as an IT professional at the time, but he would steal credit card numbers and then cash out, meaning go to ATMs and uh, copy the payment card numbers onto blank magnetic stripe cards and then put them in the ATMs and take out as much cash as he could. In fact, he was caught doing this one day in July of 2003. It was late at night. There was an undercover cop that was looking for car thieves. And he noticed this woman standing at an ATM at midnight for a really long time in New Jersey. And it turned out that was Albert wearing a really long black wig and feeding all of these blank cards into the ATM and then withdrawing as much as he could. And why was he there around midnight? Well, because a lot of the, these cards had limits that would reset. So he would withdraw, say, 250 bucks right before midnight. And then as soon as midnight hit, he would withdraw another 250 bucks. So the undercover agent stopped him to see what he was doing, discovered that he had over 70 blank cards. Well, not blank. They had been copied uh, cards on his person and arrested him and brought him into custody. And from that point on, he actually became part of the Secret Service and worked with them to take down this cyber criminal ring. So he was part of the Shadow Crew gang and eventually actually became an administrator of the site. Shadow Crew was one of the first carding forums. You can see it here. In this case, it was actually available directly on the web. Nowadays, we have the dark web, but that didn't really exist at the time. And they sold things like credit card numbers. They would provide tutorials for cashing out, give you everything you needed in order to become a criminal and perpetuate this fraud. So Albert worked with them and eventually Shadow Crew was taken down. But the reason that Albert was successful was not so much because he was wily, but because the payment card system is fundamentally broken. There is fundamentally a huge security flaw in our entire system. And really, we've spent the last two decades just putting Band-Aids all over it. And it's exciting for me as a security professional to finally see this year that we're starting to make progress on the underlying issue. So what is that underlying issue? Well, you have a really long number that you have to keep very, very secret because it's the keys to the kingdom. Anybody who has that really long number can use it to take some of your money. Um, but in order to use it, you have to give it away to dozens of people all the time. See the problem? Obviously, uh, you have to trust all the people you give it to, and then you have to make sure that they don't get hacked. So the system as a whole is very vulnerable. So what can we do about it? Well, first of all, um, initially, uh, the first step was for the U.S. government and other law enforcement agents to just start tracking the problem. So they would um, monitor cases of credit card fraud. And in the case of Albert, they were able to actually take down a whole cyber criminal gang. But that didn't really get to the root of the problem. In fact, card fraud went up and up and up over the next decade or two. So let's talk about why it continued to go up and up and up. One of the big ways that criminals used to steal card numbers, which is still an, a problem today, is physical card skimming. Not quite as much an issue as it once was, but still something you should absolutely look out for. So criminals can actually, magnetic stripe cards are very easy to read, they're easy to copy, and criminals can uh, find ways to, to copy your card number and then also use a tiny little camera to capture your pin at the same time. So here you can see, this is from an FBI alert. There's um, Criminals have uh, installed a hidden camera on this ATM that captures your PIN. There's a skimmer, often these are Bluetooth, so it, it's overlaid on top of the place you would normally swipe your card or dip your card. 
And then when you put your card in and you type in your PIN, there's an overlay on top of the keypad that likewise captures your PIN and can in, in many cases transmit it via Bluetooth to a criminal who might be waiting nearby. So those are the three things to watch out for. And often if you look closely at an ATM or a gas pump or something like that that has been hacked this way, you will notice um, strange things with the keypad or you'll be able to see that little hidden camera, but you have to be looking for it. So check for cracks, loose parts. Don't use any these machines if you notice anything odd. I know it's tempting. You're like, oh my God, I just stopped for gas and I don't want to worry about this. But if you notice anything unusual about that system, I would move on to a different one. So the criminals, the criminal underground grew to support ATM skimming. This is a business, guys. This is one example of a carding shop. They've been skimming since 2014, so they're old hat at this. And they produce cloned cards, so they get copies of your data, they make cloned cards, and then they withdraw money. They decided to open a shop because according to this group, they have too many cards to withdraw and too small an area to withdraw it, so they're geographically limited. So they're gonna be selling these cards to other people. And I love their, I, I took a screenshot of this because I honestly think it's hilarious. Why noble cards? We are same like you. We start life in poor city, very hard work. We must decide to eat nothing or eat normally by stolen credit cards. So this is a business for them. This is how they make a living. Here's another one, another part of the Noble Cards page. We're selling cloned credit cards, PayPal accounts, Bitcoin wallets. Um, now we're a big group. We produce and ship 50 cards every day. Again, they're one of many, many examples. So payment card fraud is rampant. When payment card numbers get stolen, what happens? Well, what we see as consumers is um, the card holder gives the card to the merchant, the merchant gives the card holder the goods. Easy peasy, unless the card holder is somebody like Albert Gonzalez buying a big screen TV. And then on the back end, there's the issuing bank. That is the card holder's bank. Their job is to withdraw the money from the card holder or issue credit. And then there's the acquiring bank. The acquiring bank is the merchant's bank. Now, what you're looking at here is a four party payment system. You can see these four different parties. There are also, that's like Visa and MasterCard. There's also situations like American Express where they uh, essentially function as one single backend system. So there's not a separate acquirer and issuer. They're, they're just one. So when the cardholder gives the card to the merchant, behind the scenes, there's this authorization and transaction information that goes through the card system. And then the acquirer will give the money to the merchant, less some kind of service fee. And then there will be a funds transfer between the issuing bank and the acquiring bank. Again, less an interchange fee because that's how these banks make money. And then finally, the issuer will debit the money from the cardholder's account. So let's talk about what happens in the case of fraud and who's on the hook. First of all, let's just uh, set a definition. What is a merchant? Often we think of a store, a retailer as a merchant, but there's lots of other types of entities that function as a merchant, like your cities, municipalities, nonprofit organizations, educational institutions, healthcare organizations when you pay your bill, and more. Uh, organizations in every kind of industry are taking credit card numbers and function as merchants. So that's important to understand. Okay, so who's on the hook when things go wrong? Typically it is, uh, check out the circles, either the issuing bank or the merchant. And let's talk about why. First of all, people wouldn't use credit card numbers if fraud was rampant and they constantly lost money. So the card brands have a policy that you have a $0 liability. This isn't a law, the law is actually, I think typically limited to about $50, but still, if you report things right away, by policy, your liability is normally zero. Um, however, that really is dependent on reporting things right away. So if you or somebody you know is hit with credit card or debit card fraud, make sure that you report that immediately uh, so that you're not on the hook. Then the issuer will need to um, cover your loss because that's part of the deal. So they're immediately out that money. Oh, you were cheated out of a hundred bucks. We're gonna cover that. So the issuing bank loses that money. Now the issuing bank can try to get that back from the acquiring bank or they can sue the merchant and say, hey merchant, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have taken that card. Um, in which case the merchant might be out the money as well and also out the goods. So typically it's the issuer or the merchant that ends up uh, paying the price for this. 
that's a little different than who gets the blame. If you ask um, cardholders, consumers, who should be blamed for credit card theft, 43% of the time, the store or the merchant where my information was stolen. And 31% of the time, it is my bank, the issuing bank. Um, only 19% of the time is it like the system, the card brands. And this is different, or this is unusual, not unusual, it's notable. Um, because it doesn't have to be that way. This is a management of perception, but again, really the entire system is flawed and needs to be changed. And as we'll talk about in a little bit, we are starting to see those changes happen. So as credit card fraud uh, started to become rampant, the card brands decided to do something about that. That was happening, number one, because of huge losses throughout the industry, number two, because of the threat of government regulation. So as soon as there started to be rumblings of government regulation from the US government, the industry banded together. American Express discovered JCB, MasterCard, and Visa International formed the Payment Card Industry Security Standards Council, the PCISSC. And one of their goal was uh, to help put those, create those band-aids, um, help to kind of shore up a system that was very leaky. And what they ended up doing, either intentionally or unintentionally, was pushing a lot of the liability and responsibility down to merchants and payment processors. So how is this done through the payment card industry data security standard? So I am curious to know how many of you have to deal with PCI SS DSS, uh, the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. It is a solid standard from a technical perspective. There is um, 12 categories of requirements uh, for, for securing your cardholder data environment. And they're, again, solid recommendations from a technical perspective. But Ultimately, the problem is that we have these long secret numbers floating around all of our systems, and each one of them represents risk. Each one of them is a valuable thing that can get stolen. And in many cases, merchants are just not equipped to deal with this ever increasing level of risk, especially as criminals get more and more sophisticated and uh, more adept at stealing them. So the PCI data security standard was rolled out and uh, it was a requirement for merchants, for payment processors, not for the card brands themselves, which is something to be aware of. Another thing you should be aware of if you um, are required to abide by the PCI data security standard is that PCI DSS is not a law. This is very important because, uh, for example, if you have cyber insurance that protects, that covers you in the event of a failure to adhere to legal standards, it's not a law. It is a contractual obligation between you and uh, your acquiring bank or you and whoever's issuing that credit card. Also, the PCI Security Standards Council is not a nonprofit. They say they are a nonprofit. Um, you can see right here on LinkedIn, we're a nonprofit, but in reality, they are an LLC. And it's important to understand that because um, they are advocating for the interests of the card brands. Uh, in, now, I think that the PCI, I don't mean to, to diss them, I think the PCI SSC has done a lot of important things for our industry, but for those of you that are merchants, again, it's really important to have that background and that context so that you know how to protect yourself in the event of a breach. So the members of the PCI SSC are American Express, Discovered, JCB, MasterCard, and Visa. So let's talk a little bit about how merchants and payment processors get hacked and then how that relates to PCI DSS and how we can protect ourselves. So network breaches, actual cases where merchants and payment card payment processors get hacked is the next big way that criminals will get a hold of payment card information. So let's get back to Albert Gonzalez as our example. So Albert Gonzalez is there. He's Oh my God, he's so fun. Um, he's working as a Secret Service agent and he's helping the Secret Service bust carters. So bust uh, criminals that are stealing card numbers and then selling them on the dark web or actually cashing out and committing fraud. At the same time, he gets bored and he and his buddies decide to try to hack retailers. Again, he's being paid as a Secret Service agent. So they start driving around and breaking into wireless networks and eventually they break into TJ Maxx and they decide to start stealing credit card numbers. Um, they wanna get them as fresh as they can and they start sniffing the network of TJ Maxx and trying to grab those credit card numbers as they go across the network because they find that sometimes the card numbers that are stored in databases are old, they're stale, they're expired, they, they're not working anymore. Whereas if they get them right as they're being swiped, right as they're going across the network, then they're more likely to get a valid card number. 
So this was one of the largest retail hacks ever, 94 million card numbers, and he did not stop there. Um, after TJ Maxx, he and his buddies decided to go for the jugular. They wanted to go for the payment processing system itself. And they found a SQL injection attack in the Heartland payment processing network. They were able to break in. And this was a company that processed about 100 million transactions a month. So in a fairly short amount of time, they had siphoned off um, what was estimated to be over 100 million card numbers, the biggest, part, the biggest card holder data breach of all time. Ultimately, Albert was sentenced to 20 years in prison, um, but not before he threw himself a $75,000 birthday party. Um, he buried millions of dollars in the backyard of his parents' house. He was actually reportedly living in his parents' basement when he was arrested and working as a Secret Service agent. Amazing. Um, and he said it was helpful for him to live with his parents because then he could launder money through their home equity loan. So yeah, that's Albert. I kind of wonder if he's out on parole yet. I would really love to talk to him. So then what happened is that banks and card brands, they were out a lot of money. They had all this fraud, they had all these losses, and they wanted to try to recoup those losses from TJ Maxx. So the TJX case is where a lot of that liability was originally sorted out. And it was demonstrated that the uh, card brands and the issuing banks that they represented could successfully sue those merchants and recoup, in this case, um, over $64 million. And one of the things that was used in court against TJX was the fact that they had violated nine of the 12 PCI controls at the time of the breach. So even though PCI was not a law, it was used to demonstrate that they had been negligent. And let's talk about Heartland. Heartland actually was PCI compliant at the time of the breach, which was a little awkward for the PCI security, for, for Visa actually, and for the PCI SSC. Um, they actually came out with a statement that said, well, Heartland was retroactively non-compliant uh, because they couldn't have been compliant if they got hacked, um, much to Heartland's chagrin. In response though, I was really impressed with Heartland's response. They definitely made lemonade out of lemons. So they decided that this would never happen to them again. And they created a secure payment processing system. They made point of sale systems that included encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, tokenization, and chip and pin. So they went through the entire network. They analyzed how the criminals were able to steal those card numbers, and they recognized part of the problem was that these card numbers were going totally unencrypted all across their network. And that was standard in the payment processing industry at the time. It was standard to transmit them in clear text, not encrypted to the card brands, but it left them open to attack. It created a lot of risk. So they implemented end-to-end -end encryption across their network. They also created these point of sale systems that would automatically encrypt the, um, the, the numbers as soon as a card was swiped or dipped. They also supported EMV. And and they also supported tokenization. So let's talk about what these really important technologies are. With end-to-end -end encryption, data is encrypted all the way through the network. So from the time that the cardholder data is swiped all the way through to the point of sale terminal, through the merchant's network, so that you can't, if you hack the merchant, you're not going to get a hold of it, through the payment processing network, and then through the server and beyond. So that is a huge protection uh, in the event that hackers have gotten access to any one of those points. The other big thing to understand is the value of tokenization. Tokenization is where we replace that sensitive information with a less sensitive substitute that doesn't have any intrinsic value. By the way, this token that you see on the screen is one of my absolute favorites. It's a telephone token um, that for whatever reason was imprinted with, is it safe? Uh, but this is from the days where we had anonymous phone calls where people could literally just get a token, make a phone call at a payphone at a bar, um, and nobody, nobody would know who that was. So I, I just think that's an interesting little piece of history. But the bottom line is that tokenization is when you use a different card number instead of your actual credit card number. And that means that the merchant never receives your real credit card number. So if the merchant gets hacked, there's nothing to steal. The risk is very low. This is a win-win for both consumers and merchants because it means you're not giving the same super sensitive number to every single merchant. And if one of them gets hacked, criminals can't just steal that and use it other places. So this really, you could see the value of this in the recent announcements about Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble was hit with ransomware recently. And as we've talked about in our um, recent Breaking Breaches videos and in, in our recent webinar on the uh, FBI alert, 
ransomware operators are starting to steal information prior to encrypting it, and then they threaten to publish it, release it to the world unless you pay a fee. In this case, if you look at the Barnes & Noble notification, they said, to reassure you, there has been no compromise of payment card or other such financial data. These are encrypted and tokenized and not accessible. So what a huge relief and what a huge help that the criminals were not able to steal people's sensitive cardholder data because Barnes and Noble basically didn't have it to begin with. They only had the tokenized version of it and even the tokens were encrypted throughout the network. So again, you can see this is what I would consider to be a huge success where you have a major retailer hit and they were able to come out and say there was no compromise of payment card information. There are some good things about 2020. So another place where we're really seeing tokenization take off is through um, digital wallets. So you can see if you use Google Pay or Apple Pay or the Apple Card, tokenization is used so that when you, um, when you use NFC, uh, when you use your phone to pay for goods or services, the merchant does not receive your actual credit card number. Again, this is implemented in different ways depending on the system, but what you need to know as both a merchant and a consumer is that tokenization, these mobile payments, dramatically reduce your risk and the risk of merchants. So wherever you can, if you are processing credit card numbers, support tokenization, support those uh, tokenized payments, um, payments using people's phones, because it will reduce your risk. Because of COVID-19, we have seen a dramatic rise in contactless payments. They, are, they were up 40% just in April and they've continued to climb. 80% of consumers in the world have now used contactless payments. And even though it's because people are afraid of germs, there are some other unintended consequences, good consequences from a cybersecurity perspective, where now we have so many more people that are not giving out their credit card number and are instead using tokenization unintentionally reducing risk both for themselves and for merchants. We've also had single use accounts. I get a lot of questions about this. So you can get a credit card and use it online, both for your business and in personal life, um, where it's a one, one use credit card number. Either it's a, a single credit or debit card number for one vendor that you use, um, or sometimes it's literally just a one-time number. So here's an example for JP Morgan, single-use accounts designed for businesses and organizations to use so that if one vendor gets hacked, criminals can't use that same card number at lots of other places. So this technology has been around for 10 years. It's not bad. Uh, there's probably other easier ways to uh, skin this cat, but it's certainly effective. All right, the last big technology um, that emerged over the past decade was EMV. Well, it, it's not over the past decade, but it was deployed in the United States over the past decade was EMV, also known as the chip. So if you recall on the right, we see magnetic stripe cards. On magnetic stripe cards, it's very easy to read that magnetic stripe, which is funny, by the way, I'm a geek. Um, and so I read books about the history of credit cards. <laughs> and when the magnetic stripe card was first invented, it was actually pen tested by a security firm back in the 70s. And the security firm could not figure out that there was data encoded on this strangely shaped magnetic stripe on the card that they were checking. Nowadays, however, everybody knows what a magnetic stripe is. That information is static, meaning it can easily be copied, it can easily be replicated, it's typically in clear text, and it's really antiquated technology. The good thing about magnetic stripe cards is that they are cheap. If you lose a credit card number, you can replace that card for less than a dollar per card. On the left, you see an EMV chip. So the chip is, it's a smart chip. It has a unique cryptogram for every transaction. It is difficult, but not impossible to clone. And typically that data is encrypted on the chip. The downside of EMV is that if you do need to replace that card, remember there's still a clear text number printed on it in the United States. So the implementation is still flawed. You still have that long secret number that you're giving out to everybody and you're using online. Um, and it's also more than $2 a card, sometimes much more than that to replace those, uh, those chip cards. The, now, after um, the target breach and after what I like to think of as retail get in, where all of these merchants and retailers started to get hacked, there was a big push to deploy EMV, the chip in the United States. The chip was already widely deployed in Europe and it was effective at reducing in person fraud. 
The problem is when it was deployed in the United States, it was almost like a hammer looking for a nail. And the problem was very different than the one it was solving. Because in the case of Target and Sally Beauty and PF Chang's and all these other places, the criminals were breaking into those networks. And EMV will, um, will help to reduce card cloning so that it's harder for criminals to clone your card uh, or to, to skim it. But once the card number is read into the point of sale system, once the card number is on the merchant's network, the criminals can just steal it anyway. What you really need is encryption and tokenization. But oddly, that's not what was being pushed at the time. Instead, uh, the chip was being pushed. Um, so interestingly, at the time, Brian Krebs, an investigative journalist, wrote an article, The Target Breach by the Numbers, and he wrote, zero is the number of customer cards that chip and pin enabled terminals would have been able to stop the bad guys from stealing had Target put the technology in place prior to the breach. Without end-to-end -end encryption, the card numbers and expiration dates can still be stolen and used in online transactions. So EMV, the chip, um, is it helpful? Yes, but it's not helpful against these types of attacks uh, where the merchants themselves are getting breached. So why was it being pushed so hard? Well, one thing to understand is that the chip is owned by a company called EMVCO. It is patented technology. And EMVCO is owned by American Express, Visa, MasterCard, JCB, Union Pay, and Discover. So they get a profit the more widely this is deployed. So that's one thing to understand that this is not un an unbiased rollout of technology by any means. Um, again, there, it does help with card present fraud. Here today, um, because of contractual obligations that have been pushed out by these card brands, we have um, well over 50% adoption in the United States. In fact, I think we're up above 60% adoption of the chip right now. So we've seen those numbers increase dramatically over the years. But as that is happening, card not present fraud is going up. So it's not like the criminals are giving up. They're just saying, okay, we're gonna change tactics. We can't clone cards in person as easily. We can't skim them as easily. We're just gonna target e-commerce sites. And so that is what we're seeing. This is a screenshot from the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. And you can see the number of physical point of sale attacks over the past years has dropped dramatically. And that's a great, again, a great success from a security perspective, but the number of attacks on web applications has also gone up dramatically in that same period of time. So that is the key issue that we need to address right now, which brings us to our final way that criminals get your card numbers by hacking e-commerce sites and engaging in e-skimming. So e-commerce hacking, e-skimming is when criminals are breaking into your website. Sometimes they do it with stolen admin credentials. A lot of times, especially with e-skimming, they're doing it by hacking third-party plugins or underlying e-commerce sites. And Macy's was a huge example from last year where they were hit uh, with what we call a mage card attack, um, essentially e-skimming attack. And many people's card numbers were stolen. This year, just a couple months ago, we saw the card bleed attacks where thousands of sites were hit. Um, they were all Magento attacks. There was a zero day exploit. There was a shared platform. And because so many different online shops are using the same underlying platform, you have thousands of stores that get hacked all at once. And criminals have incentive to invest in hacking tools that will allow them to break into these thousands of websites and steal credit card numbers. Here's another example from last year, Volusion, uh, which is an underlying e-commerce platform. There was a hack of Volusion and over 6,500 different stores were compromised. So we have to really pay attention to our third-party plugins and those underlying systems. Recently, there was an announcement that eight, uh, eight US cities were compromised because of a mage cars, car attack. And again, this is a great example of the fact that they're all using the same plugin, the click to gov plugin or the click to gov web platform, excuse me. Because of that, the criminals were able to install a JavaScript skimmer and skim off people's credit card numbers and personal information. So that just came out this summer. And you can see again, how the vulnerability comes from that whole underlying system. We had a question before this presentation, what should I do if my cardholder information was stolen? First of all, don't panic. Um, again, the nice thing about credit card numbers is that they can be replaced. It's not like having your medical information stolen and there is that zero liability for consumers. So the important thing is to notify the card issuer immediately, right away, because if you wait, that could actually cause you to have some liability. If you take any actions like you notify them, 
document that, get dates, times, because if they come back and they say that they never received that, um, then that could, again, uh, introduce some liability for you. And then you might want to also consider doing things like changing your passwords, monitoring your credit report, or even placing a freeze on your credit. And I'd say that would depend on the method that was used to steal the card number. If there were other personal details stolen at the time, you might want to monitor your credit report, especially if your identity could have been stolen. If you think your password could have been stolen, or even if you're not sure, just change it. Um, it's always better to play it safe. And then again, if you think your identity may have been stolen, you can put a freeze on your credit. So that's what I would do. Some interesting developments in e-commerce site hacking came out this summer. Um, I thought this was interesting. Criminals have started putting uh, skimming code within images. So as the images are loaded in a website, like here's your Doritos, there's actually metadata in them. And you can see it right here. Um, the copyright information of the image in this case has a JavaScript function in it that is run when the website is loaded and will then skim people's cardholder data. Um, this was reported by Malwarebytes, and you can see they've actually blocked it in this case. So it just shows you the value of running some kind of anti-malware software. We're also seeing criminals working to maintain access over a long period of time. So a lot of times uh, e-commerce site operators might discover a weird account or something like that, remove that weird account, not realizing that there's a script that's installed a back door. And because the hackers have access to that back door, they can go in at any time and recreate that account. So if you notice anything suspicious, like a script you can't explain, make sure that you don't just remove it, but that you do a full audit of the system. And I would highly recommend if you're responsible for managing an information security program that you um, that you uh, train your IT folks to do that and make sure that you're getting your website audited on a regular basis. Okay, again, this year we've seen an increase in ransomware attacks and um, specifically exposure extortion. So here you can see hackers, ransom, a ransomware gang um, extorted online shops. In the bottom right is a list of all these online stores that were broken into. And then the criminals are threatening to sell the databases of credit and debit card information if the ransom isn't paid. So again, just part of our trend for this year. How do we defend against e-commerce attacks? Number one, make sure you are keeping your e-commerce platform up to date. That is one of the number one ways that any e-commerce site gets hacked. Uh, as consumers, you want to check and make sure that whatever e-commerce site you use, they, they are taking security seriously. Make sure you're monitoring your e-commerce site. Again, detecting any strange accounts or unusual behavior quickly can really save you a lot of headache in the long run test regularly so that you know if there's any strange issues uh, or vulnerabilities. And then if you use third-party plugins and who doesn't, make sure that you're vetting them and that you're subscribing to any alerts and news and you're keeping those plugins up to date. Okay, finally, the thing that I am most excited about as a development is click to pay. We have been waiting for this for a long time. So remember, in person, for in person transactions like on point of sale systems, we have ways to implement tokenization. So if you use your phone um, and instead of swiping a card in a point of sale system, uh, you can have tokenization uh, so that your credit card number is not actually handed to the merchant. How do you do that in the e-commerce world? Well, up until now, there really wasn't a great solution. Most consumers were just typing in their credit card numbers, saving them into web forms, and this introduced a lot of risk. Right now, we are seeing all of the major card brands rolling out click to pay, and that is a passwordless checkout system. Passwords are dead. Um, more and more consumers are going consumers are going to see fewer and fewer passwords over the next few years. And if you have an e-commerce site, consider supporting click to pay so that you have less sensitive information to steal. If people can't steal consumer passwords, well, then that's less less risk for you, less uh, information to get breached. So it supports password, passwordless checkout. The way it does this, again, there's different implementations, is that people set it up once and it's designed to do behavior analytics, to recognize your device, to look at all the different characteristics of the device. So you enroll once. And then from that point on, when you visit that site from your phone or from your computer, it will recognize your device. It will have your credit card information uh, saved or tokenized on the back end. Um, so that you can still engage in those transactions. And they have tokenization, or at least the option for it, built in so that merchants online never have to get your credit card number. And again, that's a win-win. It reduces the risk for those of you that are merchants, and it also reduces the risk for all of us that are consumers. So where you see the option for click to pay, use it. 
Again, I want to point out who owns click to pay so that we all understand. It is owned by EMV Co. LLC. It is patented. It is trademarked. Um, EMV Co. LLC is owned by American Express, Visa, MasterCard, JCB, Union Pay, and Discover. And in this case, um, I personally, I'm really excited. I think that they've done a great job of moving the global payment system forward into the future because the big problem we needed to solve was that we had this long string of numbers that we had to keep really secret, but give away to lots of people all the time. And finally, instead of just constantly putting band-aids on, we're finally getting to the root of the issue and reducing the amount of sensitive information that's out there to begin with, which is exactly what we need to do. So here's how consumers use click to pay Again, they're going to look for that icon. They enroll once, they say, remember me. And then on the back end, tokenization gets set up so that that device gets recognized whenever they go to that store. You don't have to worry about passwords getting stolen. You don't have to worry about credit cards getting stolen. So as we talked about in our October webinar, one of the big things that all of us can do, consumers, organizations, is adopt this new technology, um, especially when it comes to payment card security, because we are seeing some really effective new technologies that are getting rolled out that can very quickly reduce your risk. So the bottom line, how do we protect ourselves and our communities? Defend against phishing attacks, right? And pay attention to the latest scams that we're seeing right now. Make sure you're using strong authentication when you do have passwords on e-commerce sites. You want to have unique passwords, use a password manager to manage them, and then use two-factor authentication wherever you can. The major sites like Amazon will absolutely support that. Use encryption and tokenization if you are responsible for handling or processing credit card numbers. Take e-commerce security measures, make sure you patch your e-commerce site, you're monitoring it, you're auditing it and testing it regularly, and then move forward and adopt new technology, particularly uh, tools like click to pay that are win-win, that are reducing risks for both uh, consumers and merchants alike. So with that, again, my name is Sherry Davidoff. Thank you guys so much for attending. And I believe we have about four minutes for questions. Yes, thank you, Sherry. What a great presentation. We did have a few questions that came up from our audience during the presentation. The first one is somebody asks that their team is getting fake texts from someone that's looking like them or other executives in their company asking to buy gift cards for the team as a COVID-19 gift for working through the pandemic. What is the best approach to handling that situation? Yeah, we see a lot of gift card scams and also like extra bonus or gift scams around this time of year. So make sure your employees know how they can verify uh, any requests from executives or team leadership um, and make sure that they're aware of the latest scams. Feel free to show them some of the screenshots that you, uh, that you saw today. We will be making a PDF of these slides available. Um, and I would just recommend regularly checking and seeing what the current scams are. But ed education is key in this case. Nice. I love seeing the scams that are current and from yesterday in your presentations. It's very insightful. Thanks. The next question we have is, what do I do if I think I clicked on a bad link? If you think you clicked on a link that's malicious, um, you may want to consider immediately removing your computer from the network. Again, we often see uh, sensitive information leaving your computer within 10 to 15 minutes or less of the time that you get infected. And I would immediately notify IT. A lot of times, you know, we're all very busy um, and sometimes people are working from home. It can be hard to get a hold of IT, especially if your computer is online. But do not wait uh, because that information can leave your computer so quickly. Get a hold of uh, an IT person right away and get your computer checked. Right on. The next and last question that we have from today's attendees are, um, can my computer get infected if I open an email but don't click on anything? Yeah, good news. Typically, your computer will not get infected if you open an email and don't click on anything. Um, mail, email client vendors are uh, have gotten pretty good at protecting against that. So it's, um, you know, if you know something is malicious, obviously don't open it at all. But if you open it and you don't click the link, you don't click the attachment, you should be fine. Great. Thank you, Sherry. Once again, I am Natalie with LMG Security, and we would like to thank everyone who attended today's webinar. Please take a moment to fill out the survey afterwards and let us know what you thought of Sherry's presentation. The recorded video and the handouts will be made available to all attendees and we will send out a notification once they are live. Thank you to everyone for attending the December LMG webinar and have a great day.